Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good you could join us again here this year. I was here last year in getting it right, Canola, and glad to be here again this year. I am Brian Hansen. I'm the research agronomist at the Langdon Research Extension Center. And I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about uh, agronomy considerations uh, for this coming spring and also into the growing season. Barry already showed this slide, so I am going to move on. A little bit about seed selection. At this point in time, I'm sure most everybody who's growing canola has gotten their seed. A lot of the big sales and things like that happen in November and December. But in November, usually the extension bulletin for canola comes out. Um, and if <clears throat> in that bulletin, you'll see the different varieties that were tested across North Dakota. Here's a Liberty Lincoln Clearfields. It shows the different types, whether they're stacked, uh, the black leg rating, uh, club root resistance. And then on the data tables, you'll see the varieties <clears throat> from each of the locations where the trials were run. Um, again, the types, we generally take uh, days to flower, maturity, plant height, uh, percent cover at some locations, and that is a measure of stand and vigor, and oil content and, and yield. Now, if you want to see the data a little bit earlier, <clears throat> usually that gets put on the website. Most most time you'll see those in October. Uh, this Right now in NDSU, we have two websites. We have an older website, which will, they'll be phasing out um, at some point in time. But that generally had the crop on the left-hand side, and you pick that, and your location where you'd want to see were the NDSU trials, and you get a PDF file. The newer site is a little more interactive. Again, we have the crops on the left side, and you can pick your years or counties where you may want to look at, or RECs, and then you click again on uh, the location you'd want to uh, look at the data. And you can still get the PDF form here if you just want to print it out and have it. Otherwise, there's tables and charts. You can click on the wheel. You can click, if you just want to look at yield, you can look at yield. Just pick your variety that you want. And you have that option. Or there's also the option, if you want to get a more visual look, you can uh, choose a chart. Again, here's just yield um, with uh, all the varieties in this particular one, but you could check pick two or three varieties if you wish. So that's a little more visual. Herbicide traits, obviously, <clears throat> we're growing through flex and a double stack, a few of those out there. A newer one you might have seen uh, starting, I think it was about last year, the Optimum G. Uh, this is a trait uh, developed by Pioneer and it's essentially the same as a true flex where you can um, <clears throat> spray a little later in the season up to first flower. You can spray twice or you spray once to get the maximum rate. Uh, <clears throat> oil types, um, there's some high oil layout, but that's mostly in Canada, and those, that's an IP system, so I don't think we have that here. And you've, I'm sure you've seen advertised, the uh, new seed has the old, new omega-3 canola. It's really uh, for a fish and some uh, human nutrition markets, and those varieties are available with Liberty Link. And talking to the representative there, um, <clears throat> It's earlier in their program with this. So the yield, maybe 80, 85%, maybe it's the higher other varieties, but they do get a, give a price bump on that. So you should be getting equal amount of uh, a market price for that. Okay, a little bit about uh, canola rotations. Rotations are very important. Canola, as with other crops, generally two to three years, and i probably say three years between canola crops across the state. Um, Cereals should generally follow. There tends to be some, um, a fair amount of, of canola volunteers some years. So it's important you got to get that out next year. And depends on what crop you have, how easy it is to get it out. And of course, herbicide considerations, rotating crops and herbicides, you know, for re herbicide resistant weeds. Um, there's some carryover issues um, from the previous crops. So make sure you know what you put on the year before and if it's going to affect the germination. And of course, controlling what canola volunteers. Um, canola does that develop harder seeds, so it can stay in your soil bank for two to three years after you plant canola the first time. So you kind of need to have a plan to get those out in subsequent crops. Uh, Vincat's chopper is going to talk about disease considerations you know, earlier, earlier this morning here again. So I'm going to let him talk about the club root 
Brasilium stripe and Black Lakes glaratinia, which are all important considerations for canola. <clears throat> this is in Manitoba back at 2010, 2016 on, on larger acre fields, you see 120. Um, <clears throat> and the canola, if you look at that crop there and then the, what the previous crop on the left-hand side, and really there's no very little difference between any of the crops that were grown for a decrease in yield in, in, except for a sunflower. And uh, the barley was 100%. And of course, canola and canola uh, wouldn't work out too well. So this is, uh, yeah, you can plant canola basically on, on most crops the following uh, for the previous crop that you had. We did do a canola rotation study back in um, 2013 to 16, I think I got there. I, and <clears throat> Um, soybeans came into the area about in 2013, quite a few of them. So the question was, well, and the canola is well established. So can you plant canola and soybeans in the same rotation? So basically we had two sequences going at uh, these three locations, whether you plant wheat on soybean <clears throat> or soybean on canola or canola on wheat or canola on soybean. And then we did replicated those sequences two times. And, and basically the bottom line is that we didn't see any significant differences in yield or, or test weight or plant density. A little caveat here, we didn't have many diseases that were observed that time. So we still want to be aware of sclerotinia as you can uh, um, have more sclerotinia in a canola crop than you can a soybean crop. So be aware of that also. Seedbed requirements. Of course, like all crops, seedbed preparation is important to having a successful crop. Canola, of course, with a small seed, likes a well-packed seed bed. And, and if Mother nature, nature is kind to us, we'll have moisture within an inch of the soil service, surface and need to uh, be aware of how I many tillage practices uh, we do in the spring, whether you have to get urea on or if that was fall applied, you have to put um, sulfur on. So it's best to uh, try to minimize, that, minimize those and put have a shallow uh, tillage operation to save some of that moisture. Plant establishment, um, seeding depth. You know the standard that we hear is zero to five inches or zero to 1.5 inches. Um, <clears throat> several years ago, we studied, did a study across the state looking at emergence, part of a seeding rate study. And we found kind of the old standard you hear. Um, at three quarter inch, we had 80% emergence. At inch and a half, we had 60% but we didn't see any significant yield differences. So canola has great ability to compensate if it does have a lower stands. And you also have to be aware, of course, of soil crusting if you get hard rains or, or frost, or the, certainly the flea beetle pressure has been quite high the last few years. At the end of the day, you need to evaluate that stand. Equipment, <clears throat> most people have air seeders in some areas where they have more corn and soybeans, and we have row crop planters with a little wider row. Um, double disc press drill or hole openers are usually um, the standard fare here. Broadcasting seeing is generally not recommended. That kind of fails in the category. It's better to be lucky than good. And of course, you have to set your, your air seeder and all the sections of it so you get the proper depth and good seed to soil contact, watching your speed and your air speed on your air seeder to, so you don't blow it out of the furrow. Seeding date, um, Barry talked about this a little bit. Um, early seeding tends to produce the higher yields and it varies by region from late April to mid-May, and especially later May here in the Northeast part of the state. And typically that's to avoid some of the higher temperatures during flowering. And that doesn't mean for extended periods, it could be a, a day or two, it's really hot. And if your crop tends to be flowering, then you're gonna lose some of those uh, pods in the middle of the, the main receive there. If you plant too early, there's also some risk, especially if you face cold temperatures, it's slower to emerge. You're gonna lose some of that, um, maybe insecticide effectiveness or fungicide. And with the flea beetles, I mean, pressure being so high lately, that could be a very important issue. So best if you could plant when you have fast germination emergence, um, if you have soil temperatures greater than 50 degrees. This planting date study we did back in 2011, and uh, <clears throat> that was a very wet year. I think I wanted to plant it like May 1st. 
And this little piece of canola right here is probably the first piece that was planted in Cavalier County that year. But you can see June 16th was our last date. And <clears throat> there it wasn't even barely bolting yet. So how did it do that year? Well, that year we did actually had the highest yield that late date. We don't see that all the time. Um, generally up here, we get into the last week of May or early June. You can like avoid some of the flea beetle pressure and still get good yields. It was optimum in June 3rd that year. But we'd also get years where we do maybe run out of moisture and do get a decreased yield um, later in the season. So um, plant within conditions are ready. And when soil temperatures are warm, and a lot of these years here was when we were so wet up here, we're kind of forced to plant uh, earlier or later in the season. Now, some of this date is a little bit older. As Barry's talking about, they moved the, the final planting date. So I haven't seen them. Um, there's, there's some more uh, planting date studies going on, but this was maybe about 10, 10 12 years ago. <clears throat> and you see that here, the earliest planting date, April, and we went up to May or the May 12th in Carrington, and didn't lose much yield. Heading area get past mid-bay, and you start losing quite a bit yield. Langdon is, is pretty flat, and also mine at kind of about the 20th of May really started dropping off. So it's an, still important to watch soil temperatures and, and getting it in uh, um, fairly early. Plant population can vary, of course, over a wide range, and has a little effect on yield because um, canola is very... Produce can produce the deck a lot of extra branches and pods and make up for that. Kind of the established <clears throat> seeding rate we've seen over many years in Canada or tested in the North Dakota here is you can establish five to eight plants per square foot. You're going to get about 95% of your total yield potential. It drops down to three to four plants, you get 85 to 90, two to three, 60 to 80%. And the biggest thing on here is uniformity. How <clears throat> uniform are those plants across the field? Is it thinner on the height heel tops compared to the bottoms? And then you might have a issue that you'd want to uh, look at whether you want to replant or not. It's just a graph. It's from 85 sites in, in Western Canada, five to eight, we get about 100% emergence and it does decrease. But again, you get down here and it does drop off a lot. But over a, a field situation, it, of course, depends on the, the uniformity. Seeding rates, I did find a study <clears throat> that was just done not too long ago in Saskatoon and also in, in Carmen, which is just uh, in north of Cavalier County. And they did come up with that still at five to eight seeding seedlings per square foot and with a row spacing about 12 inches or less. If you do have, as I mentioned, those open areas, you know, canola is not able to compensate for some of those reduced covers when you have poor stands. So the highest canola yield requires agronomic practices, including seeding rate and row spacing that result in rapid canopy closure. The faster you can cover that ground up and not see any bare soil, the higher yield you'll have. And row spacing does have an effect, but it was at, wasn't minimal compared to uh, seeding rates that had wider rows, although in both in Saskatoon and, and uh, Carmen, they didn't always, they always trended lower with a narrow row spacing. And seeding rates, um, last year we had uh, about 50 different varieties. And so the average seed size was 60 to 151,000 seeds per pound. Though the range, so the average is about 97,000 and it came out to about um, 4.7 pounds an acre at that 10 seeds per square foot. I did a little back calculating. If you're going to do a 22 inch row, you want to um, not have that higher seating rate. If you want about an inch spacing, you'd be at about somewhere around 2.9 pounds. So some of the companies now are selling 10 acres in a bag and they're adjusting it for seed size, make it a little bit easier, 10 seeds per square foot. And if you <clears throat> getting seed from a company that doesn't do that, it's probably a good idea to always look at your seed size. This is just a study we did back about 15 or 16, <clears throat> just some yields. You know, the, when we planted three skeets per square foot, we had the lowest yield, but as it, we did go a little higher, we did get a little higher uh, yield, but not too significantly. But even when you put the seed, cost of seed in there, 
really didn't have much difference in a net return. Um, a little bit higher here between uh, 6 and 15 seeds. So still in that 6 to 8 uh, range. Row spacing studies we've done, 6-inch, you know, 12-inch, 24. Uh, we couldn't get the our plot planter down to 22, so we're at 24. But you can see we're not covering that ground as fast as we can compared to a 6-inch or 12-inch even. So we got that open area. So we're going to be losing some yield there. So I said canola can really have some good branching. If you do have some poorer areas, a lot of branching, more pods. If you're planting in a wider row, as I mentioned, you want to cut down the seeding rate. There's a lot of little plants in here that are not going to produce anything, and they're just competing against each other. And this is a little lighter seeding rate, so it looks a little bit better. But this is just um, years we did row spacing and seeding rate studies. <laughs> This is um, the net return we're looking at. The three row spacings averaged over the four seating rates and and four seating uh, row spacings. So 12 inches, we didn't six and 12. We didn't see any difference as far as the net return compared to 24. And the seating rate lowest at the end three. Not much difference between the six, nine, or 12. <clears throat> Swathing. A recommended swathing stage canola out in the western North Dakota. You've probably been straight commenting for longer than you have in the northeast here. Uh, it's it's hard to say, but driving around now, I'd say at least 50% or more of the canola here is is probably straight cut. If you're going to swath yet, maximum, you like to see, if you have a good stand, it's about 60% of the seed on the main stem has a seed color change. And <clears throat> if you have a lot of acreage, you want to... Um, you know, start swathing before that, or if your crop is seeded at um, in the show over a short planting time. Or back in the <clears throat> back in the 90s, the recommended was like 30 to 35 percent on that main stem, and we found out we're actually losing yield on that. Straight combining, you get generally less green seed, higher oil content, and equal yield. So normal seed swath. Maybe a little bit earlier than that 60%. You're going to have some of them reddish ones here, which means they're not quite fully mature. Here you get a later swath. And if you straight cut, you generally get that more of that black seed. Of course, some farmers uh, let it dry down naturally. It will work. If you get in September and you get cooler days and nights, that's going to take a little longer. You can use pre-harvest aids with um, Regalone. 80% of the canola in the brown stage might take five to 14 days, depending on your field. If you just have weeds in there you need to get rid of, um, you could use glyphosate. If you want weeds and a burn down, you could use Sharpen and glyphosate and Roundup. And maybe that field might feel you're better off if you're going to swath it to uh, pick it up. So that can be done as well. Last couple of minutes here. I want to talk about winter canola. It's always kind of been talked about. Hey, why can't we plant winter canola to get higher yields? We had limited success, success here. We've had inadequate winter hardiness, newer genetics with better understanding of planting production. Most of the time in the studies we've done in the past, we've looked at anywhere from end of August to the end of September planting dates. So now they're talking about planting six to eight weeks prior to the first killing frost. And this comes out of Canada. Up by Great Falls, they had some success there, but they have a, of course, it's a different environment, but they have a, a wheat canola rotation. They want good moisture to harvest, don't dust it in, and avoid hair pinning so you don't have your coddle, hypocotyl develops above the soil line. <clears throat> and the year before I tried it, um, just basically plant in October, um, or August 12th, so we had some good cover there. And the next, and then next year, it looked like that. So that wasn't so great. I'm rolling it here. Um, then we did a study with Barry. Gonna go over this quick. We planted Langdon and Hedinger. Hedinger was so dry, it really never came up. Langdon, we had three dates, and it looked like this. So we had some good growth. July 28th, August 11th. 25th, you went up to seven to eight, five to six, and four to five leaves. Following spring, 
the largest um, canola looked like this. Nothing you don't want to see in your field. And the middle one was a little bit better, maybe 20, 30%, but there's still a lot of gaps. And on the right side was, uh, that's just weeds. So uh, stick to spring canola at this point in time, unless you're adventuresome. That's all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you.